Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Making It Work. We're so thrilled to see you all today. Thank you for saying hello. You are our readers and our subscribers, and we're here to share business stories and perspectives that matter to you. We are fueled by your support, so thank you for being here. Before we get started, I'd like to extend our deep gratitude to our Making It Work sponsors. They are Cross Insurance, Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, and Memic. And with that, I'd like to introduce the Vice President of External Communications at Memic, our friend, Tony Payne. Tony. Thanks, Kate. So good to be here. Uh, thank you to the Press Herald for putting this great forum on. I know that uh, we've had hundreds of small businesses from across the state tuning in for uh, best practices and some good group thinking. Um, with that, uh, Memic is the state's largest workers' compensation insurance company, insuring about 18,000 main employers, and we estimate somewhere between 200 and 250,000 employees are covered uh, through workers' comp and Memic. Um, with that, though, the, where, you know, whether you're uh, expanding your e-commerce um, capabilities or pivoting toward new ways of doing business, all we ask is that you do so safely. And that particularly if you're reopening your place of business, um, having taken a hiatus, uh, we suggest, if you would, go to our website at memic.com and click on the COVID-19 um, resource tab, and you'll find uh, some guidance as to how to uh, most effectively and safely reopen your place of business. We wish you all just a load of luck. Um, keep it going, get the main economy back on track, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing many of you next week at the next um, Making It Work. Awesome. Thank you, Tony. And now I'd like to introduce the Director of Sales in Maine for Harvard Pilgrim, Bill Barasa. Bill. Hi, Kate. Thank you very much. Oh, very nice to be here again. I actually want to take a moment of my time to, to thank the Press Herald and all of you here who make this happen. Uh, not only is this an important information, you know, for information purposes for us to learn and, and it's also very important for us to be together, right? So this is an opportunity for us to hear from our business leaders from across the state as well as to connect uh, on a human level. For those of us who are in our offices at home and, and uh, this is mostly what we see all the time. So thank you. Uh, at Harvard Pilgrim, we too uh, turn to a virtual reality. Uh, we do all of our business now virtually, connecting with our business partners in this manner. Uh, we have worked with, uh, partnered with the YMCA and Cooking for Community to help with their meals program, uh, as well as provided a number of our nonprofits here with some funding relief. Um, so thank you. Um, as I said last week as well, this might be a, a tagline for me each week. After you visit memic.com, please go to harvardpilgrim.org, uh, check out our Living Well programs and join some of our uh, wellness programs, our, our yoga visits, uh, mindfulness visits. You can do all of that online and I encourage you to do so. There's no better time than right now or more crucial time to, to take care of your, your health and well-being. So thank you. Bill, thank you. Um, thank you to Tony. Workplace safety is so critical. And thank you to Bill. It's amazing how both your companies have invested in our community and we thank you. Next week will be our last Making It Work before we take a little hiatus in July and August. We'll be hearing from Realtors on how they're navigating the white hot residential real estate market and what they anticipate for the future. So please tune in for that. And before we begin the discussion, I'd like to introduce the Press Herald Director of Special Projects, Carol Coltis. Take it away, Carol. Thanks, Kate. Welcome, everyone. We're delighted that you can be here with us this afternoon. Uh, when we were talking about this topic, we realized that for a lot of small companies, the idea of fast tracking an e-commerce platform is uh, it, it's not a natural sort of place you end up. For a lot of companies, e-commerce, enhancing e-commerce is part of a five-year plan. Uh, it's often you know, predicated on some surplus revenues, um, but everything changed when the coronavirus made its appearance and Maine's business community reacted to that from the middle of March and is continuing to react to that. So, 
what we have what we found is is in our conversations with our three panelists today is that they come from smaller companies and they come from a cross section of Maine's business community and they all had e-commerce enhancements as kind of a back burner one of these days we'll get to it goal and then the coronavirus came and suddenly what had been a back burner issue became a front burner issue and they're here to talk about how they handled that and what's the impact been so um, i'm going to introduce them in just a minute but before i do a word about our format uh, the panelists and i will be chatting for about a half an hour or so and then we will open it up to questions from you in the audience some of you submitted questions when you registered for this event uh, but folks can submit questions by clicking on the raise your hand icon at the bottom of your Zoom navigation bar. So we'll get to as many questions um, as we can. So let me introduce our panelists. Uh, first, we have Jesse Baines, who is the sales and marketing director for Atlantic Sea Farms. If you're not familiar with that company, you should be. They grow, harvest, and process kelp. Um, and they've been doing that for nine years now. And 70% of their business revenue came from restaurants and from meal kit companies. And so when the pandemic struck and restaurants closed, it really presented them with a do or die situation. Um, and they have sort of, there's an interesting aspect to this that has to do with the New York Times. So I'm sure Jesse will, will talk about that. We also have Jim Werner, who is the operations manager for Independence Floor Systems. So that company is really small. It's just four employees, but they have been around for many years as a wholesaler and distributor for flooring products. And they had an interesting association with a company that builds, that makes knee pads. Because if you're installing flooring, you're going to need knee pads. And from that connection, and with some help from a friendly dentist, we're able to diversify into making face shields for people who are on the front lines of the pandemic. Um, and so their journey with e-commerce also took an interesting track and the impact from that has been really significant and Jim will talk about that. And then our, fin our final panelist is Holly Martziel. So Holly is, the um, marketing manager for Rosemont Market and Bakery. Everyone knows Rosemont. There are six stores, three of which I believe have reopened in some fashion. Um, and they had sort of a different situation because unlike our other two folks, when the pandemic struck and business, their market business sort of dried up, Holly had exactly the opposite reaction. People started to put in online orders for groceries um, en masse because they were concerned about stocking their pantries and their refrigerators during a pandemic that who knew how long that was going to last and what the impact was going to be on, on local food supply. So Holly's story is a little different in, the, in how the company responded by enhancing its e-commerce platform and maybe invested just a little too much and she'll talk about that. Uh, so, um, so my first question, I know I've just teased what your situations are, but if you could talk a little about what was your pre-pandemic e-commerce uh, presence, what prompted you to upgrade, and what's that impact been in, in terms of your business operations like revenue and market? And Jesse, since I introduced you first, let me ask you to answer that question first. Yeah, happy to, Carol. Um, thanks so much for the introduction. Uh, so as Carol said, we are a, a, a kelp company and all of our products are refrigerated or um, frozen. So e-commerce wasn't really a huge part of our business. Um, we launched it back last April, a year ago last April, because um, after a founder transition and some rebranding and a new website, uh, we had a big New York Times piece coming out and the, the, the pressure was on and we worked with our partners at Pulp and Wire to um, launch an e-commerce platform and a brand new website in short order. So in that period of time, we really made sure we had everything we needed uh, ready to roll. And of course, as a food startup, everything has changed 20 times in that year. Um, but our e-commerce for the last year has really just been on the back burner. As you said, it wasn't a priority for us 
Um, it wasn't a huge revenue stream. It's really expensive to ship things um, frozen and fermented. We're committed to foam-free packaging as well. So um, that adds another barrier. Um, but we were trickling along. And um, we actually, uh, right before the uh, pandemic hit, we received a Tastemakers grant from CEI um, to support our digital marketing. And my background is actually in digital marketing before I started with uh, Atlantic Sea Farms about a year ago. So I was excited to, to activate that plan, right? And then everything changes. So what went to was originally going to be geared towards overall just um, brand awareness and supporting our uh, small trickle into or our slow trickle into retail um, all of a sudden became all retail, all e-commerce. Um, and so we were very lucky to have that grant at just the right time. Um, and partnering with CEI was, was a fantastic experience. Um, so we basically got a three month punch um, of uh, support for our e-commerce um, digital marketing, as well as uh, support for our retail stores was really what we focused on in that time. Um, we ended up seeing a huge spike. We were about 300% growth in e-commerce sales. Um, our retail market has grown from just uh, a few placements in New England to up and down the East Coast, basically from Virginia North um, with really good saturation because we had really solid brand awareness at that time. Um, so people were coming to us to find out how they could put, get our products in stores. Um, and we really saw um, a lot more people cooking from home with our kelp, which was very exciting. So people were posting about uh, what they were making with uh, Atlantic Sea Farms kelp at a time when people were cooking at home more than ever. So that's kind of where we are right now in that space. Um, our e-commerce, we actually just turned it off for the summer because foam-free packaging means we can't ship in the heat of summer to California. But um, that's kind of the projection, like sort of the, the timeline and um, from one year ago in April to right now. Very cool. So Jesse, let me just ask a quick follow-up question. Mm -hmm. How essential was that grant from CEI? Like, do you think you would have done this if you hadn't been able to get that from, from CEI? That's a great question. So um, I guess the answer is it was, it, it was a huge um, boost to be able to have some cash in when cash flow was definitely leaner than it would otherwise have been. Um, we do have great... Um, uh, presence in um, as an ingredient with meal kit companies. Meal kit companies were also growing. So as a business, we were doing okay um, when things first turned around. But more than anything, it was that the money was already dedicated to that. Mm -hmm. So we just had to press play. Um, so it wasn't too complicated to really get that moving. We had a great partnership with IBEC Creative, which we still have. Um, and they really helped us um, turn that on fast and effectively. Uh, so we were able to do that. And um, at the same time, we also, the budget that we had allocated to do demos in store um, and for staff travel to do sales, we didn't need that money anymore. So right. we were able to also use that, use that funding for, um, to continue to support the wins that we saw in digital marketing. Cool. Cool. Thank you. Jim, tell us your story. You, you guys didn't even have really any kind of an online presence. It was an email address, right, before the pandemic? Email address was the catalyst. <laughs> um, just first want to say thank you for inviting me to do this. This is awesome. Um, and I think it's really cool to wave connect and to get messages out. And um, that's part of why I love living in Maine. It's kind of this small community that all supports one another. So thank you very much for having me here. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so... Prior to the pandemic, I would say Independence Floor Supply, we didn't even have a website. Um, we did, but it was embarrassing. Um, really, when this business started in 2012, to be opened up with vendors to you know have direct to mill relationships and be able to have that title of being a distributor or a wholesaler, the first question out of their mouth would say, well, where's your website? Um, so at the time, I think he spent $100 and it was literally just a domain name. And when you went there, it was a green screen with some block lettering, um, which in you know 2018 was, it was pretty embarrassing when people would come in to meet with us and they would say, well, I went to your website and we would just go, oh God, <laughs> I apologize about that. Um, but so two years ago, I was approached to come on board um, as the operations manager here. And one of the first questions they asked me was, what would be the first thing you would change when coming aboard? 
And I said, well, the first thing we need to do is we need to have a professional email address because they were operating on gmail.com, um, which is fine. Um, but to give that appearance of being a company, um, I felt that we needed to have, you know, it associated with, with at IF supply or something thereof. Um, but obviously independence floor supply is a very long lengthy thing to type. Um, so we came up with IF supply and that was the catalyst that kind of started the momentum of generating a website. So once we were moving towards creating an IF supply email address, um, we created a more modern uh, 2018 type internet site. Um, you know, we wound up not knowing anything about it. And, you know, none of us have a digital background or work in marketing or anything like that. So one of the people who sublet an office space in our warehouse next door to us had an IT team, um, which he put us in contact with them. And we basically just told them what we wanted to do. Um, we weren't intending to do anything with it other than have our email address. Um, but they just kind of ran with it. You know, they asked us a series of questions. We just gave them the freedom to build whatever they wanted to do. And then before they published it, they bounced it off us to make sure we were okay with everything that was on there, making sure all the information was correct. And so in the beginning of you know January of this year, we wound up having our website, our email addresses all changed. Um, and at the time, um, my background is in financials. I worked in Chicago. I was a day trader um, for a number of years right out of college. And then I was a financial planner uh, before moving here to Maine. And um, so I still have a lot of friends in that industry. And, you know, when we first got wind of the coronavirus and the severity of it in China, um, a lot of my friends were reaching out to me back from Chicago, just, you know, just saying, this is what we're expecting on our end. And, you know, we just kind of being the planner in me started having those conversations here about, you know, if this virus gets to the United States, what is that going to look like? for the building community um, and contractors and people letting people on their houses. And we just assumed we were gonna be sitting here twiddling our thumbs. Um, and so we kind of started those conversations with one another around, are we going to potentially have to open up to the public? Um, because as we stand right now, being a wholesale distributor, uh, we are primarily here to support the flooring contractor and some other small contractors in the area. Um, and we don't have a traditional retail store where, you know, people are just walking in off the street. We, we do meet with customers, but they're customers of our customers. Um, so we have basically a group of 25 to 30 individuals that generate over 80% of our revenue, um, which is a very scary thing, thinking that that's all going to come to a crashing halt. Um, and so we just kind of, I, for lack of a better term, was poking the bear, my, my boss saying, you know, this may force our hand that we potentially have to let people walk in off the street and kind of realizing, you know, if people are sitting at home, they're going to realize, you know, I don't like my tile in my shower, or I don't like the tile in my bathroom, or I really need to change these floors, you know, just to keep our lights on to get on the other end of this, we might have to think about the retail side of the flooring business. Um, and where we settled was somehow, um, why don't we pick one item that maybe we can sell online? Um, as our first venture into the retail side, um, as far as selling directly to the public. And we kind of narrowed it in on the knee pad because we knew the size of it, we knew the weight of it, so we could figure out how to package it, how to ship it. Um, and then again, just kicked it back to our IT team, I guess we'll call them, or our web host. Um, and just said, this is what we're looking to do, how do we do this? And within a week's time, they came back to us. They had built us, you know, an e-commerce website, set everything up with UPS. Um, and we were set up to sell our first knee pads online. Um, it was kind of a, one of those moments where it's kind of the stars aligned where ProNe, who is a manufacturer of very high end knee pads, um, is actually a company, a Maine based company. They're in Whitefield, Maine. Um, they were deciding to kind of give up their direct distribution to the end user and wanted to focus on their distributors across the country. Uh, us being the only current main distributor, they had reached out to us about January 15th or right around the middle of January and asked us if we would want to potentially take on all out of state sales. And we were just like deers in the headlights that we were just like, um, 
yes. We, we don't really know what that means, but yes. <laughs> Um, which has come with a lot of bumps in the roads, to be honest. Um, but they're all good. They've, you know, they've, they've pushed our boundaries. They've forced us to learn new things that we otherwise wouldn't have done. Um, and on their end, what wound up happening with them was, um, you know, basically with everyone stopping working um, and people being not wanting people to go into their houses, you know, new construction business has been fine. Uh, but the remodels and the renovations of people living at home and having people in their house, obviously there's been a lot of concern around that. So that, that end of the business is pretty much dried up and is still very dry um, for lack of a better term there. But um, they're, they noticed that their business significantly slowed down, you know, going basically into the first weeks in February and they looked around their facility and said, we have all this raw material. What can we do with it? And they developed a uh, PPE face shield, um, which was designed to get into the hands of first responders, so particularly firefighters, uh, EMT crews, and police officers. Um, and a friend of the company, um, his husband happened to have been a dentist, and he saw the face shield and realized how high quality the, the materials were involved in putting it together. And met with them, developed a prototype over about a week and a half. They submitted it to the ADA, they got approval, and they developed a different style of face shield to account for uh, the loop and all the other medical gear that needs to be worn uh, during a medical visit. And again, they reached out to us because luckily we had our e-commerce website in place and we are now handling all out-of-state distribution for um, two types of face shields and it's just been an incredible journey um, and something that has just basically went from nothing to you know last month we did just over thirty thousand dollars in sales just in face shields online which wouldn't have been a part of our business so um i think i hit on everything you need yeah <laughs> Thank you, thank you. And how about you, Holly? Tell us the story of Rosemont. Yeah, well, the story of Rosemont goes back a long time, um, which is definitely relevant. You know, we have a really strong brand presence in our community. And, you know, as Carol mentioned earlier, you know, most people know about Rosemont. Um, we, so we do have and have had a strong digital presence as well, uh, at least within Maine and within our area. And, you know, we have a website, we have a strong social media presence, a great uh, email list for all of our consumers. And I actually just started with Rosemont in January, this past January. And um, Rosemont had had some marketing efforts prior to my starting with the business, um, but it was time for the business to really become very intentional with their digital marketing. And so when I began, you know, we had kicked around the idea and a little bit previous to me being there as well about e-commerce and it had been played with a little bit in terms of, um, you know, ho some holidays, like we wanted people to be able to order their Thanksgiving turkeys from our local supplier online or our local flower subscription. Um, but it was a little bit of a of a homegrown system at that point. Um, so it wasn't something that was in place for us. Although we did have the platforms available, we hadn't really um, set it into motion quite yet. And then uh, the pandemic hit and we made the decision pretty early on as an essential business to, to remain uh, in business or open, but not open to the public. So we really felt um, that our employees safety was leading the charge in our decision making. And we have um, at Rosemont, as you mentioned, Carol, we have six markets locally in the greater Portland region, and we employ over 100 employees. So it was really important to us that our team felt safe and heard. And so we decided to close, I believe it was uh, right around March 15th or 16th, but right about the middle of the month and, and then needed to figure out quickly how to still continue to provide food to our communities. And uh, if you recall at that point, um, there was a lot of massive grocery shopping uh, situations happening and the 
Hannaford and even Amazon, Whole Foods and, you know, Shaw's and Instacart, it was really, really challenging to get an order slot or a delivery time or even a pickup time. And Rosemont was able to fulfill those orders. So we were well positioned in the beginning to take on a lot of the grocery needs for our community. And we very quickly, like in the matter of just a couple of days of closing um, and very true to the Rosemont style, built this like homegrown online order form, right? And so it was like pages upon pages of boxes that you could check to figure out what it was that uh, you wanted for groceries. And it was apparent to us very quickly that this was not going to cut it, um, especially at that stage of the game. So, um, so we had that running for, I think it was like uh, maybe 10 days, two weeks that that form was, uh, was happening. And during that time, we worked with the same company that manages our um, point of sale system at our stores. So that the company that does our, our uh, registers and our inventory at a store level, and they offer a solution for e-commerce uh, for this, for grocery shopping. So we enabled that system at all six of our stores. So we were able to uh, integrate our inventory system with theirs and had that up and running uh, April, early on in April. And that really changed the game for us. It allowed us to uh, do a better job of, of accuracy in fulfilling orders. It gave our, our store staff that had gone from really a customer service position to this like crazy pivot in operations to then um, shopping for customers and picking orders. Um, you know, it required us to kind of rearrange the way that our stores were set up so that they served picking orders as opposed to in-store shopping. So it was a monumental shift in operations at a store level and our team was incredible and so dynamic during that process. And then this new software system really helped us be able to maintain that uh, over an extended period of time. So this was around the time where I think everyone started to realize this, you know, this isn't going to be just a couple of weeks. So, um, so we implemented that software system, kept the curbside order process happening and then uh, really saw the demand and the need for home delivery. Uh, so if you, any of you have been around Portland for a long time, you may remember the original, very first Rosemont Market was across the street from our Brighton Ave Market, where it sits now at 559 Brighton Avenue. And that building had been empty for some time. It's actually for sale. And um, we took about a week and completely repurposed the building to become our home delivery hub. So we, uh, our stores were so overwhelmed with curbside pickup orders that they couldn't possibly fill the curbside orders and the home delivery orders uh, at their individual locations. So we completely revamped that space, made it a home delivery hub, um, purchased like another software license for that space and employed a local contract uh, company to do our delivery service for us. So. So now we're up to seven locations and seven of these um, licenses for our e-commerce platform. And then it shifted again, which I think everyone's just kind of in whiplash um, as we continue through this, this global health crisis. Um, but at this point, we are starting to reopen our stores. So we are in an interesting position as an essential business. We were able to be open uh, you know, technically speaking, through the entire pandemic. And we saw a lot of our competitors stay open during this time. And as I mentioned, we, we made the decision to close. Um, in doing so, you know, we may have put ourselves uh, at a competitive disadvantage in that decision, although it felt right for our company. Uh, there are people that still want to shop in stores. And especially at a place like Rosemont, the shopping experience really is going into the market, you know, touching the produce, talking to the team there, asking questions, trying wine. Like it's, it's very much an experience to shop at Rosemont. And we recognize that we were missing that uh, with our online platform. So we had to both enhance our online platform um, presence, like taking photos of all of our products, adding descriptions, recommendations on there, and also look for a way to really safely reopen our markets. So 
As you mentioned, we have three open now. Um, we've made some really big changes within the markets. We've added some PPE, um, you know, uh, fiberglass around the registers. We've created some new systems, obviously are limiting the number of people in the stores. Everyone's in masks. We ask our customers to be in masks, you know, so we've done a lot of the um, safety measures to be able to reopen and are working through that process now. So um, in doing that, we're seeing the demand for curbside and online ordering decrease. So um, it's definitely a challenge in that we made a very large investment in this online shopping platform and now the need is less. So as a business, we're in an interesting situation right now where we need to put our, our creative thinking caps back on again um, and think about how we're going to repurpose and better utilize our e-commerce platform licenses to continue to ge uh, generate revenue as our stores reopen. Well, right now, you're in the process of just sort of reassessing and, and refining, <clears throat> excuse me, what your e-commerce investments are. Because, exactly. As you said, you have had whiplash since the middle of March. And so maybe, you know, in the future, you may not want all of those licenses that that's still something that you're you're contemplating right now. Right. Um, Jesse and Jim, would, would you talk a little about where you are with your businesses in terms of what you think is going to be part of your standard operating procedure post pandemic? And if the investment in your enhanced e-commerce platforms was worth it, have you recaptured that investment? Uh, yeah, I can start. Um, absolutely. And I just want to point out that we are, we partner with Holly and Rosemont. And the last time I talked to Holly, we were planning seaweed week, <laughs> which did we're not happen. We were planning tastings. <laughs> yeah, we were planning tastings. Um, and then that, you know, obviously changed. But, um, but yeah, I think that um, our investment um, in our e-commerce really was primarily digital um, marketing, digital, you know, ads and stuff like that on Google ads and um, social media ads. So that was definitely worth it. Um, and not only did it build our brand, um, but it also allowed us to build a platform um, and audiences that we know we can uh, switch on as we work towards targeting, supporting our placements, like with Rosemont and that kind of thing. So, you know, we were basically shifting from like, buy this online to buy this at Rosemont. Um, which is great and, and effective already. We're already seeing results from that, which is awesome. Um, but as far as the infrastructure piece goes, and as Holly talked about, like that was, an, an, that was a challenging shift at a time that, I don't know how much anybody here knows about kelp farming, but <laughs> this all also happened when the kelp harvest season started. So we work with 24 different partner farmers up and down the coast of Maine. Um, there are almost all lobster fishermen heading into what is probably gonna be a very bad season for lobster. Um, so the pressure was on to succeed in a huge way. We had to have a successful harvest. We had to pay them every penny that we committed to paying them um, and we did. And part of that is because we were able to turn on e-commerce um, and just hustle these new, you know, hustle is a terrible word, but like we hustled to get these new placements and these new um, ways for people to purchase our products so that we could um, make that work. So on the other side of that, are we going to be directly hand packing our own e-commerce boxes, you know, or 60 to 70 packages a day? I hope not. You know, <laughs> like I don't want to do that, but, uh, but we, so we really did, it was a combination of bringing in new help um, and also just throwing in and doing it ourselves. Like there were days where Brie, our CEO and myself were back there, um, you know, processing kelp and packing boxes. Um, and so I think that, you know, as we, it's really great for us because we naturally have this pause over the summer where we're not going to be sending out e-commerce um, to assess, figure out how much it cost, how figure out how much we made, you know, really understand the nuts and bolts of it to see if it is something that we want to continue to do in-house, or maybe we look to a third party to help us with that project. But at the time, we didn't have time for that. We just threw in and, and got it done. Right. Yeah. How about you, Jim? How, how long did it take for you to recoup your investment or have you already? 
Uh, we de we recouped our investment, you know, at the end of the first month. Um, but I think we're unique in the sense that, you know, that the website, the e-commerce side of it, luckily when our people built us the website just for the sole purpose of, you know, the catalyst of having the email addresses that I have supply, they knew that was in our thought process, you know, that we wanted to kind of put our toe in that water maybe next year or a year after that. Um, and so they kind of already had the framework there, which we were fortunate. So we went into it and made the investment in our online website and email addresses. We weren't even thinking about necessarily the cost of recouping it from an e-commerce platform. We were just willing to spend that money up front to get us into a more professional status as far as handing out business cards and sending emails to communicate with our customers. Um, so, you know, kind of being blind to it, we weren't really worried about recouping that money. And obviously there was an additional cost for them to then take all the product SKUs because the unique thing about Prony um, versus other knee pad manufacturers where, you know, most people will wear a pair of knee pads, they wear them out, they throw them in the trash and they will buy a brand new pair of knee pads where their knee pads, every part that's associated with them can be replaced. Um, so if your buckle breaks or your strap breaks or the leather on the front of it wears out, you can replace that individual piece. And so we went from um, just thinking of selling an all purpose knee pad, which we thought we were gonna have one or two SKUs to, um, I think we have over a hundred SKUs on our website for all the individual pieces down to, you know, the rivets and the pieces of plastic or the zip ties um, to hold the things together. Um, and now I'm going on a tangent, but the, um, you know, the cost of it, you know, just on the knee pads, knee pad side of it, we definitely recouped within the first month. And then the pandemic forced them to change their operation. And we just happened to be a beneficiary of that, um, that, you know, getting PPE into the hands of the people who need it. Um, you know, we've, we've made that investment tenfold. Um, you know, it's it, at this point, it's just kind of, it was a no brainer to do it. Um, and now we're transitioning. We're starting to think about, you know, how long is this going to last? You know, how many face shields can we possibly sell and how do we keep this ball rolling? And so the next point that we're looking at is how do we keep promoting the business and how do we keep promoting our e-commerce platform and what else can we offer on that e-commerce platform? Um, you know, we've unsuccessfully and back to where I said there was been some bumps in the road. Um, all of the advertising that I have tried to produce gets denied by Facebook and Instagram because of the sensitive subject of PPE. Mm -hmm. um, but I think they think we're trying to take advantage of a situation. Mm -hmm. um, so fortunately, we have a manufacturer behind us who is doing advertising um, that is driving a lot of out-of-state business to our website, which we are you know, very fortunate for. Um, and so our next step is to determine where do we spend our money and how do we spend our money to let people know, um, you know, a, we have, you know, PPE, but aside from that, you know, promote the knee pad business and then determine what is the next thing that we are going to offer. Um, cause obviously flooring's a little bit difficult because some people need a hundred square feet of flooring and other people need, you know, 3000 square feet of flooring if they're doing a whole house. And the logistics of shipping that around um, aren't as easy as just knowing weights and dimensions from UPS because there's, you know, 18 wheelers involved in moving stuff like that around. Um, so I think our next venture is potentially on the e-commerce side with our existing customers, allowing them to place orders online. So when we come back in the morning, you know, we can do all that versus having to do it by phone, um, but then identify more products that we could potentially ship across the country. But, you know, back to the um, the point of, you know, who's packaging this and who's shipping it and who's doing all that. Um, that's what was so eye-opening to us is um, depending on when the ads get run by the manufacturer, you know, three weeks ago, we came in on a Monday morning and we had over 200 orders sitting in our inbox for us. And there's three of us who work here full time and one subcontractor who, you know, works by appointment only at, in a couple of tile showrooms. Um, and we have a whole other business to run. And so we have certain orders that people just wanted UPS ground. Okay, that buys us a little bit of time, but people who are paying for next day air and three day select shipping, just to thumb through those orders to separate out, 
who's got select shipping versus ground shipping. So whose do we have to get before the UPS guy shows up at noon today? Um, and it's just kind of, those are the kinks that we're constantly working out about, you know, creating an order of operations about who's, you know, just because we all share emails here just to make sure we're not missing something, which creates its own challenge. So if someone clicks on an order and then gets pulled away and then somebody else keeps picking that or, you know, so we've had to, you know, kind of reevaluate our order of operations to make sure that there's only one person who's actually printing the orders and sorting them and then to kind of taking that control to determine these have to be done by 10 a.m., these have to be done by noon, these have to be done by end of day. Um, and it's very cyclical because usually, you know, these bursts in sales are all within 72 hours of an online advertising going out. So there's wow. definitely a direct correlation between spending money on advertising and sales going out the door. Um, and so, we are now in cahoots with Prony to say, you know, tell us what time this advertisement was running so that we can make sure we're prepared for that influx of orders that are going to come through the door. Um, and then just other things as far as people who are thinking about getting into it. Um, I couldn't stress enough just to kind of take the time up front to go through the language, you know, 15 different times, um, because it could be very confusing, especially for, you know, people who are buying something for the first time who aren't necessarily familiar with the language of, you know, how you package stuff or what the order is. Um, so it's also created an issue where our phones have not stopped ringing. You know, we'll get calls from California to Alaska to Canada. We had one person call from Australia. Um, asking us questions about our website and the process to check out and order stuff and how they didn't want to use PayPal and things that it sounds, I sound, I hate saying this, but it's like, we, just want to, we don't have time for this because we still have our everyday contractors walking through the door who want their, you know, they want their floor finish and their floor stain and their, their hardwood flooring and our phones just will not stop ringing. Um, and so that's, we've, I think, at least three times a week, we make some sort of change to our e-commerce platform. Um, so I would definitely recommend, you know, whoever does that for you, keep them on retainer. Um, it's, they're worth their weight in gold. Um, you know, you just give them a direction and they'll, you know, they'll change your refund policy or change the language or how you add items to the cart. Um, just all stuff that we would have no idea how to do. Well, thank you, Jim. I think that's good advice. And I was going to ask Jesse and Holly if you had advice for, um, for uh, other business folks who are con contemplating upgrading their e-commerce platform. I know that it, it, there have been a lot of surprises in your journeys and, and Jim just went over a bunch that, that his company has, uh, has managed through. Um, and his advice, make sure you ask a lot of questions in advance and can have maybe someone on retainer who can modify things as, uh, as, you, as you go forward. H Holly and Jesse, what kind of advice do you have for folks? I think um, probably one of the biggest lessons that we learned, Jim alluded to as well, um, that there is quite a bit of a learning curve involved with uh, our customers not even to mention our learning curve as an organization, but um, you know, we actually created two new positions throughout uh, the pandemic for people um, in customer service roles just to help with the e-commerce platform. So a place where um, you know, people can call or email, they can assist them with ordering, um, creating how-to guides and frequently asked question guides and that kind of information um, because it doesn't run itself as much as it sounds like it does being e-commerce. Uh, there's definitely a level of support that's needed. And I would say both on our side for our consumers as well as, uh, and again, Jim mentioned this too, you know, having a, a software company or e-commerce company that will offer support as well. Um, so there has been a lot on our end, um, additionally, that language that needed changing and things that just weren't, um, you know, completely seamless throughout the process that we needed our, our software to update and to um, pay attention to and make changes for us. And so I think really asking those questions when determining what e-commerce platform to utilize and then considering how it will affect your operations as well. Good. And how about you, Jesse? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that uh, two, two things. Um, first, 
uh, my general suggestion for e-commerce is don't bother unless you're going to support it. So if you're, you need to send traffic there, people aren't just going to find it by themselves, you know? So, you know, per what Jim said, you know, an ad went out and next thing you know, they have 200 orders. Um, that is very real. And what's great about that, um, connecting the digital advertising to the e-commerce is that you can track exactly how much you're spending against how much you're making. Um, that is one of the few places where digital advertising is literally, I spent this and I made this. Um, and so I think that's a really valuable tool for businesses to be able to say, I spent $3.80 on every transaction that came through. Um, so I would say track all of that early on, right out of the gates and watch it grow um, mm -hmm. or shrink and make, it, make changes. Um, and I think the other thing too is exactly what these guys said, the customer service side of e-commerce is very real. Um, I manage it for us. And, you know, I hear like, you know, uh, John Stroud is asking a question about e-commerce and the, the sold out message versus the pausing e-commerce for the summer message. And it's hard. It's very hard to like make sure everything's synced up um, and, and make sure that it's clear for people because uh, it's never clear for everyone. So you had just have to be ready to jump on the phone or jump on an email or jump on Instagram direct messages and make sure um, everybody's being helped because that's your brand. Your right. message back is your brand and your attention to detail and your attention to your customers is your brand. So um, at definitely setting aside resources to make sure that that's done well um, is important. So, um, and John, to answer your question, yes, they're not sold out. They're just paused for the summer and we're working on that on the website. <laughs> I, I see we have a few more questions um, in the queue. So Strawberry, do you wanna, you wanna queue up the first question? Yes, uh, I was gonna say the good news is that you have touched on some of them already, so that's great. Um, one question for Holly, could you speak a bit to the cost of home delivery, minimum order requirements, logistics of timing, and whether you had to subsidize the actual delivery cost? Yeah, absolutely. And I just do wanna mention, I see a lot, not in the Q&A, but in the comments, about people uh, wanting to keep us to keep the service going and it, it will continue. We are continuing with curbside and home delivery. So thank you for your support. Um, in regards to the cost, the order minimums and the logistics, it has been something that we have continued to fine tune throughout the process. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're working with a, um, an independent contractor who's helping us currently with our home delivery service. And so um, that cost is something that's passed on to that company. So it's not one that we as an organization are profiting directly off of. It's something that uh, is used to cover our cost of the service. Uh, in terms of the order minimum, um, so when you have a business model that customers shop for themselves, uh, which is what Rosemont was, uh, the cost of labor is very different than when our employees do the shopping for the customer. And so when we have a certain amount of orders we can fulfill in a day, so just physically able to fulfill in the time that we are open, um, it is an important ratio to consider how the cost of labor is affected by um, the order, the revenue that we're making from an order, which speaks to the order minimum. So if somebody places an order for a loaf of bread and a, a gallon of milk, um, the cost or the amount of time it takes to process that order is higher than what the order itself is bringing in for revenue, just as a sake of a basic example, right? So um, that's why we had suggested the order minimum of $35 because we wanted to keep it accessible to our community. However, we had to be mindful that that small order was taking up one of the slots of the day. And so we, we worked for a while on the language around encouraging our customers to think ahead a few days, which is a big shift in the Rosemont shopping model, right? We had always been that market where you stop by and you grab a gallon of milk and a loaf of bread or a bottle of wine or the tomatoes you need for dinner tonight. So we had worked for years to condition our customers to come in regularly. And then we were asking for this big shift in shopping habits to think ahead a few days, to place bigger orders less frequently so that our employees could focus on filling as many orders for as many members of our community as possible. So it wasn't that, um, you know, we didn't want to serve 
the smaller orders that that it's that it really didn't allow us to um, operate for a sustained amount of time if that was the model and so we had to make some hard decisions around that um, and if you recall that period of time in our process it was um, always a suggested order minimum you know we, we certainly tried to encourage it but we also tried to fulfill those smaller orders when we had the the capacity to do so and so that's where those decisions really stemmed from cool Thank you. Yeah. And it looks like we still have a question. Uh, this one from Mark Straffen. How much of what you're doing now will carry over into the post-pandemic world? All of it. <laughs> All of it. Yeah. I would Thank agree with that. You know, the, the, the hope is it's, a, it's another revenue stream for the business. You know, at the end of the day, we're we're in business to, you know, to make money. And so hopefully if we can continue to grow that side of it. Um, that'll create another full-time job for somebody. Um, and who knows down the road, it can even create another job to have a full-time marketing person on hand or, you know, who knows? So hopefully it continues. Yeah, it will be interesting. We ought to check back with all of you folks at the end of the year, especially um, since Holly and Jesse are in the process right now of assessing what's been the impact of your enhanced e-commerce platforms and at the end of the year, is it all going to, to be, you know, to, to work out, to, to be a, a, a savvy investment? Jim, it looks like you've already made that, that determination that that was a, a good decision for you and, and will continue to be a good decision for you. Um, good. Well, it looks like we have taken we have taken up 50 minutes of your time, everyone. Thank you. Um, and if we were still doing our, our B2B webinar, well, if we were still doing our B2B forums in our, in our physical space, I would ask the audience to thank you and our panelists would hear thunderous applause. So please hear the thunderous applause from our audience. I'm very grateful that the three of you took time to talk with us today. I think you're all making really insightful decisions and we really hope for the very best that this will all uh, work out well. And at the end of the year, we'll all have a big celebration because we survived the pandemic. So, um, and as Kate mentioned at the top of our program, next week is our last Making It Work uh, segment and we're looking at home sales, which if you didn't know, Maine was on a trajectory December through February of breaking every record in the books. And then the pandemic hit and boom, uh, things sort of screeched to a halt. But they have begun to rebound. And uh, it's a real sweet spot for sellers right now because there's a very low inventory and um, mortgage interest rates are at a historic low. So. Our, our, we'll have real estate agents talking about how they're using technology and other strategies to get folks to a, to a closing. And um, so come back next, next Wednesday at one o'clock and, and listen in there. And in the interim, thank you again to our panelists. Thank you to our sponsors and to the audience. Um, it's been terrific having your insight and experience to share this afternoon. Mm -hmm.